<coughs> Merci beaucoup. So I'll speak in English. Uh, the, I, I'm, it's, it's, thank you very much for the introduction. It's, it's lovely to be here. I was here last time about a uh, little more than 10 years ago uh, to take some uh, American university exams, and so I'm delighted to be here and, and that it's now my turn to in inflict the pain. Um, so I hear, the, I hear the, the students at ENS in Lyon are much more relaxed and more cheerful than the ones in Paris. So I guess I'll see whether it's true or not today. Um, and I gather what you expect from me is to give you some uh, flavor of uh, research topics and questions in computational neuroscience, and also to try to convey a little bit why it's useful to use some mathematics to understand the brain without, I guess, using any mathematics or just using a little bit of mathematics in this talk. So it's a very difficult task. It's a little bit like trying to explain to somebody how an orchestra sounds without being able to use any instruments. So what I've decided to do is to, um, uh, is to show you a collection of examples of how the nervous system might process inputs that are, are coming in from the outside world and then try to draw some broad conceptual conclusions from these examples. So it would be very different from a usual talk in which uh, one poses a problem and solves the problem. Uh, so what I'll do is something much less structured, and you can think of it as some kind of stroll uh, along a few examples. <coughs> so you've probably had this experience that you're in the street or in a cafe, and you see a very beautiful girl, and you want to talk to her, so you start thinking, you know, what, what excuse could I find to, to talk to her, and then what, what can I say, and so on. And, and if you're like me and you're slow, by the time you start moving, she has noticed and, and she runs away from you, as it's depicted in the, in the picture. And, and so you get very depressed, and then you, you start, you, you're depressed because she left, obviously, but you're also depressed because you're so slow, and um, you start thinking about what just happened, and you realize, after all, that maybe you're not so slow because a lot of things have happened in a very brief time, things that you feel you cannot control, like your heartbeat being elevated or your mouth becoming dry, and things maybe that you control a little bit more, like some feelings of admiration or beauty, and, uh, and, and maybe even some rational thinking. And, but even before any of that, there's a lot of thing that, things that happen, very complicated things that happen effortlessly. For example, you effortlessly notice that it's a human being and not some other life form. And um, had you seen this girl uh, at night or uh, in bright sunlight, you would have had no trouble recognizing that it's the same girl. Although the pattern of light coming into your eyes is extremely different. There's a huge difference between the left and the right patterns of light. Also, you had no problem noticing that whether that this girl was uh, running leftward or rightward, and uh, even more so, you had no trouble uh, saying that this girl is not running towards you, but is in fact running away from you. Is, that, is this a pointer? So, so. Uh, how's that? Uh -huh. okay. <coughs> so all these things you did very fast and very effortlessly. And what I'm going to try to show you today is some examples of how some amount of this happens very early on, already in your eye, already in your retina. So what does it mean to say that you've seen this girl? What it means is that you're uh, translating this picture, this image, into uh, neural signals that are communicated from one neuron to the other. More specifically, the way they're commu communicated is that one neuron will generate some pulse, some electric pulse like this, which is then transmitted along its axon until you get to some region where the two cells meet, the synapse, and the signal is, is passed on from one cell to the next. And this is why this cell is called the presynaptic cell, because it comes before the synapse, and this is called the postsynaptic cell, because it comes after the synapse. And during this talk, I'll often schematize things this way, whereas here is the presynaptic cell, the synapse, and the postsynaptic cell. Now, maybe how many of you are, are physicists? Okay, and how many biologists? Okay, half and half. Um, <coughs> so I'll show you also some data uh, 
I'm doing this to bring everybody up to speed. So I'm, I'll, I'll show you also some data where here you can see spikes, these action potentials that I've drawn here. And here, uh, it could, it, that's a so-called raster plot. So it's either repeats of the same experiments or the output of different neurons. Every red tick here is one of these action potentials. And what you have here in blue is a time average, the average of the number of these red ticks uh, over time. So, and this is called the firing rate. So it'll give you how many of these red ticks you have per unit time. This is what these peaks express. This is another uh, similar representation, maybe slightly zoomed in. So you see the different spikes here. And here you see the firing rate that corresponds to some time average of what happens. OK? So <coughs> the, this translation from image, uh, from some image to some neural signal, happens at first, of course, in the eye. So you have some amount of light that goes from the image into the eye. It gets absorbed in the retina which is the, the neural uh, sheet that lines the back of the eye. In the retina, this image is converted into a neural signal. And this neural signal is sent first to the thalamus, which is some kind of relay station in the middle of the brain, and then sent from the thalamus to the back of the brain, uh, called the back of the cortex, called the primary visual cortex. And from there, it's sent all over the brain in all kinds of different areas. Now, what's interesting is that in humans, about 40% of the cortex, or maybe half, uh, is devoted or at least involved in, in vision, OK? So it's a huge machinery involved in vision. And so whatever is dropped by the retina is dropped forever. And whatever is deformed by the retina is deformed forever. The retina is this little gateway that uh, sends information to this huge machine that you have behind your eyes. So what is this retina? Uh, as I said, this retina is a little piece of a neural tissue that lines the back of the eye here. And it's made up of a few layers of nervous cells, of cells that are very similar to brain cells. That's why I say it's like a little brain in your eye. And here you see a, a, a picture of a human retina. H uh, here you have the fovea, where you have the best visual resolution. And here you have uh, the blind spot, which is essentially a hole in the retina here through which the veins and the, and the nerves go. And you can easily see that hole. I don't know if you've done this. If you close one eye and you fixate right in front and you move your thumb to the right about 10 degrees, your thumb disappears. You should try it because it's very impressive. And I like when you try because it, it makes me feel that everybody's telling me I'm giving a great talk. So, um, so if you zoom in a little bit, uh, if you zoom in a little bit, what you see is that this uh, retina is essentially made up of three layers. You have a first layer here of photoreceptors, cones and rods, as you know, that is sitting in the very back of the eye. And these are the cells that will receive light, followed by a layer of bipolar cells, so-called bipolar cells, that convey the information from photoreceptors to ganglion cells. And then, so this is the first layer, the second layer here, and the third layer. And then you have these yellowish cells that kind of look like octopuses uh, on this picture. And these, this is horizontal cells about which we won't talk much. And these are amacrine cells about which we'll talk quite a bit. So these are, of course, sketches. But you can see in a, in a real photograph of a real uh, human retina, you clearly see the three layers of cell bodies and then in between some layers of fibers uh, that connect the cell bodies. OK, so another reason, uh, there are a number of other reasons why the retina is really a little piece of brain in your eye. One reason is that it grows from the brain. So actually, when the embryo grows, the retina advances from, from the brain into the eye. So it's a real piece of brain. And the other reason is that it's very different uh, in its structure from the other early parts of the other sens senses. So if you compare, for example, sight with smell, what you see is that in smell, uh, you have uh, some receptor neurons that sit in the epithelium of your nose and express some receptors. And maybe exp you have maybe a 1,000 different kinds of them. But uh, whatever the number, every cell directly sends its axon all the way to the brain. So there's no intermediary processing. There's some parsing that goes on in the nose, and it's sent to the brain. Whereas in the retina, you have a few. Uh, units or a few dozens of different cell types. Uh, but you have, so you don't have a 1,000. You have a few dozens, maybe. But then you have this complicated circuitry that already is there outside of the brain. And so you have an, an, an amount of processing that occurs 
in the retina uh, may be similar to the amount of processing that occurs in a little piece of cortex. Okay, so what kind of processing happens in the retina? Uh, maybe the idea that you have the, about the way the retina processes some image signal into some neural representation is that it's roughly like a, a Xerox machine. So you think that, well, it's taking some picture and sending some photocopy to the brain. And very crudely, it's correct, but if you look at it uh, more in detail, it's a very poor analogy. And I think a much better analogy is that of a um, painter or a writer even, which send a very stylized, which create a very style, who create a very stylized representation of the input, or even a representation that is altogether in a different language. Okay, and part of the talk will be to explain how this stylization occurs. Now, why, of course, this kind of stylization, this kind of processing occurs in the brain many times over, and so why choose the retina? Why not go directly into the brain? And the reason is that the retina being much simpler and sitting outside the brain, you have a much more direct access, both experimentally and theoretically, but in particular experimentally. So what you, the way experiments go is, 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 uh, is very transparent. You take out the retina out of the animal, a salamander, a rabbit, a, a monkey, one of these, and you shine some film on the retina and then you can, of which you have complete control, and then you directly measure the uh, output of the ganglion cells of the retina, that is the cells that send their output to the brain. So you, you can control exactly what arrives in the retina, and you can read off exactly what the brain receives from the retina. Yeah, I forgot to mention, you take out the retina, and then you put it in a saline solution, and it survives there for maybe eight or 12 hours, and it responds quite well for maybe two or three hours. So you can do quite a bit of recording. So this is how the apparatus, another uh, uh, cartoon of the apparatus where you have the TV that does any movie you want. It's narrowed down, focused down to the size of the retina with some prisms and lenses. And the actual thing looks, look, looks a bit like that. And then the retina is laid on top of a microelectrode array so that you can measure the activity of many cells at a time. And each of the electrodes will tell you uh, some spiking of uh, the cell to which it's near. And this is how it looks in reality. So the black prongs are the metal uh, little pieces of, of uh, electrodes. And then the green dots and lines are the cell bodies and the axons of ganglion cells. Okay, so now that we know how to measure things, let's come back to the or one of the original problems we had and see uh, what we can say about it. So what I said is that you have a huge variation of uh, the amount of light that comes in your eye between, say, night and midday sun, but you still are able to process it very well. Now, it's, it's nice to just pause a second and see how large that variation is. Okay, because at starlight, where you can still see shapes and see movement and you can see, still see a number of things, there is one photon that enters every one of your photoreceptors every, any guess? Every 10 minutes, okay? And you can still see. Now that's, that's quite impressive, I think. Now, at sunlight, in strong midday sunlight, there is about... 10 to the 6 photons every second that enters every single photoreceptor, okay? So you have a variation of maybe 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10, something like this. So now, I don't know if you can think of a machine that works just as well effortlessly when the input changes by uh, 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 10, okay? So how does the retina deal? Um, well, if you look at a picture like this, even if the total amount of light that arrives in the retina is large, what you can notice from the outset is what is informative is where it changes. So if I follow this line, interesting things happen here, 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 okay? So even if the light intensity as a whole is, is very large, uh, I don't really need to, to take it into account. If I just take into account the small differences here and then tuck, I go through the waist, I come out of the waist, there's the arm, and so on. What is important here to describe this picture is for me to tell you where these things happen, okay? And what's very interesting is that the retina is already built in such a way that the cells will pick up precisely these kinds of events. 
So this we can see exactly with the kind of experiments I described um, <coughs> by shining light on a screen and measuring the output of the retina. Here I've defined for you what is called the receptive field, and it's a very simple thing. It's only the region in space uh, that is seen by a given ganglion cell. Okay, so if I shine light within the receptive field, it affects the ganglion cell. If I shine light out of it, it doesn't. Okay, so now if I do <coughs> this experiment uh, as follows. So if I shine light in the middle of the receptive field of this ganglion cell, I'll see some amount of response. If I shine light on the surround, on the outskirts of the receptive field, surprisingly what I see is a decrease in the activity of the cell and not, not an increase. If I shine light everywhere, you would have naively thought that you see an increase, you see an even larger increase, but what you see is just some uh, very minute increase. And finally, I get the largest response if I shine light in the center and put dark around. Okay. So how does, this, how does this work? We can see it very easily if we uh, go back to our anatomy. Uh, so uh, as you remember, what I said is that you have photoreceptors that will absorb the light, light coming in, okay? They will be excited by this light, transmit their excitation to bipolar cells. They in turn get excited. They transmit excitation, uh, you know, some signal to the ganglion cell that then uh, uh, emits spikes that are sent to the brain. So there's a direct path going through these uh, bipolar cells that is that so-called excitatory and excites the ganglion cell as a function of the amount of light received. Okay. Now there are lateral paths that now go through these amacrine cells that I've drawn here in blue. And these amacrine cells are not excitatory cells, but they're inhibitory cells. And so they're inhibiting the activity of the ganglion cell instead of e exciting it. So if I look at the top view of, of this little device, if I put light only in the center of the receptive field of the ganglion cell, uh, then I'll excite it. And if I put light, a little bit of light outside, then it'll have an inhibitory effect, okay? So by contrast, if I put dark around, it'll excite it even more, okay? So you should get this because I'll come again and again on these receptive fields. So I hope it's, it's clear. If it's not clear, you should ask me. Here. Okay, so now what happens, for example, if I put a bar of light here and then I move it uh, through the receptive field like this. If I move it through the receptive field, what I'll see is some response like this. When the bar goes through the surround, I'll have inhibition mostly, so the activity of the uh, cell is suppressed. And then there's a sharp increase of activity when the bar is on the center, and then again a suppression when the bar is on the surround, and then kind of the set returns to its, its basic state, its natural state, okay? So this, you can think of this as some form of predictive coding. What does that mean? It means that the cell, the ganglion cell, is sampling the input in space, and it's weighing positively the input at the center, the amount of light at the center, and weighing negatively the amount of light on the two sides, okay? So if, if you use the center as a prediction of what happens on the two sides, well, if it's the same, the things will cancel out and you get zero, but then you get a non-zero response only if it's different. For example, if you have light here and dark there, okay? And that's why some people call this predictive coding. Now, something I haven't explained to you, but you can imagine that it's very similar to this, is that, um, Inhibition arrives a little bit later than excitation, okay? So you also have some form of predictive coding not only in space but in time. So much so that the recent past is weighed positively and the more distant past is weighed negatively. And so that means that these ganglion cells are not only good at detecting spatial uh, gradients, spatial changes, but also temporal changes, okay? So that in reality, although some cells are sustained, like the ones I just showed you before, most cells are what people call transient. So they respond in time very briefly and they respond to a change of the input and not to the input itself, much in the same way as a cell here responds to spatial changes, okay? So uh, now some of you who are already bored may be thinking that uh, okay, these are ramblings of a physicist. It's some interesting details and so on. So I want to show you that this is not the case. And uh, so you probably, um, if, if you have normal eyes and brains, you probably think that this is much darker than that. Okay. And, the, and it's wrong. 
this is exactly the same color as this. And the reason you think this is darker is because here you have lighter squares around it. And by comparison, your eye immediately calculates it as being darker. Whereas here you have darker squares, and so your eye thinks this is lighter. Okay. So now if I hide the surround for you, right. you see that they're exactly the same color, actually. Okay. Now, now your retinas are a bit stupid, so if I take it out, you'll see them different again. Okay, so I, I like this quote that I found of Delacroix, where he says, Donnez-moi de la boue de la rue et j'en ferai la chair la plus délicieuse. And I think he was thinking of, of these receptive fields. Because what he meant was that color of something or the impression depends really on what you put next to it. So I cannot resist, I shouldn't do this because it takes time, but I cannot resist uh, just doing a, two transparencies of a historical digression on this because I like the story. So the, probably the first uh, such illusion was the Mac band. And uh, as all of these illusions, it's a mismatch, oops, it's a mismatch between the actual image and the perceived image, okay? So here the actual image is some amount of light, then a gradient, and then a lower amount of light. Some amount of light, some gradient here, and then a lower amount of light, okay? The perceived image has a peak here and there, I don't know if you can see it very well, but you, you should be able to see a lighter band here, kind of whiter, and that is this perceived peak of white that you see. And the only reason is because your cell has parts of its surround in the dark, and suddenly it thinks, oh, well, then, then, then this part must, must be lighter, there must be more light. Okay? Now, the more common realization of this is just the horizon. You've probably noticed that there's a white line at the horizon. Well, this is a MAC band. Okay? And what's interesting is if you measure uh, retinal cells that lie across this gradient of light intensity, you do find that cells that are near fire much more strongly. So you do find a peak in the firing, a peak that resembles very much the peak that you have in perception. Okay? So the guy who figured this out was Ernest Mach, and uh, he's the same Mach who influenced Einstein on relativity, so he's um, a smart fellow. And this is what he says. He says, since every retinal point perceives itself, so to speak, as above or below the average of its neighbors, there results a characteristic type of perception. Whatever is near the mean of the surroundings becomes effaced. Whatever is above or below is disproportionately brought into prominence. One could say that the retina schematizes and caricatures. The teleological significance of this process is clear in itself. It is an analog of abstraction and of the formation of concepts. So I don't know about the last part of it, but um, what's extremely impressive to me is that this guy had no physiological ex experiments to go on with. So he actually d predicted that you would have center surround receptive fields in retinal cells from these illusions. Okay, so that. I think you have to be very, very, I, I think you'll agree with me that you need a big uh, mental leap, a big mental effort to be able to deduce this or guess this. And, and maybe, it's because he's, um, maybe it's because he's thinking so, so, um, so much that his fists are clutched like this because he's really focusing on this problem. And um, it, it paid off because he got his stamp. Okay, so if you can keep your fists clutched for long enough, can get your stamp. Okay, so, so much so for um, historical digressions. <coughs> so what we said until now is that these retinal cells come uh, with uh, these center surround receptive fields, and these are circular, so they'll respond to a spot of light, but they'll also respond more or less equally well to bars of light with different orientations, okay? But now the situation in the brain is very different. <clears throat> in the brain you also have, in the primary visual cortex, for example, you also have receptive fields, but those are <clears throat> most of the time elongated. So <clears throat> this such a receptive field, for example, responds much better to a horizontal bar of light than to bars with other orientations, okay? To bars of light that are along its axis, okay? And then in even deeper areas in the brain here, for example, you have cells that are specialized for even more complicated patterns. For example, there's an area where you have cells that can recognize the face of a physicist as opposed to more normal looking people, for example. Now, <coughs> before, um, 
so, so what I want to say, so now that I've taken so much time to establish this, I want to tell you that this is in part wrong and that you can even find complicated things like this in the retina. But before doing this, I just want to say one more um, uh, word about how, how this all works is the fact that these receptive fields are constantly adapting. They're not static objects. So you've all had this experience if you're in a dark room like in a movie theater and you come out and there's bright sun, you're blinded for a while, you can't see very well, and then after a few seconds you can see again uh, normally. And presumably what, was, what has happened is that when you were in the dark room, this receptive field uh, adapted itself so that you would have a lot of plus, a lot of excitation available. And that uh, big excitation available becomes, uh, you know, fires a lot, creates a lot of activity when you go in light, and then after a while uh, you, you generate more inhibition and you decrease the amount of excitation available, and so you're able to see again very well in bright light, okay? So the picture that, the crude picture is you have these circular receptive fields that are kind of adapting all the time in the retina, and then you have elongated ones in the, in the brain. And so people would think the retina takes care of spots of light and the cortex takes care of shapes. Okay. But there's a series of very nice experiments that were done at Harvard in the last few years that show that this, this uh, picture is, is not rich enough, is incomplete. And the experiments go, go as follow. Suppose that you're in an environment that has mostly vertical uh, shapes, like a forest with trunks that are vertical for a while, and then you switch to an environment with mostly horizontal shapes like this picture, okay? Well, if I measure what is going on in your retinal, uh, retinal cells, what I'll see is some activity that wanes over a few seconds, and then when you switch environment, you suddenly have a sharp rise and then a waning again, okay? So presumably what is happening is that this receptive field, the receptive field of this cell is, is adapting, but it can't all adapt to zero, okay? Otherwise, you would never see this sharp rise here. So presumably what is happening is that it's adapting in such a way as to become uh, less receptive to such input. So it's elongating in the perpendicular direction. So when I now have horizontal shapes, this thing can pick it up very nicely and you have a, uh, you have a sharp peak. And again, you, the, the activity wanes and presumably what is happening is that, again, the shape of this receptive field readapts, okay? So that's a cartoon, but you can actually do the experiment, and you do it in the following way. You show uh, some inputs here, an input with a lot of horizontal lines in it for 10 seconds, and that's the input you use to adapt the cell. Then you probe the cell with a mixture of horizontal and vertical <laughs> flickering like this. Or you can adapt it with respect to vertical gratings, and then probe it with a mixture of vertical and horizontal for one second afterwards. And what you see is that after you've adapted to horizontal, your cell is much more sensitive to vertical inputs than to horizontal ones, okay? Whereas after you've adapted to vertical inputs, your cell is much more uh, sensitive to uh, horizontal inputs than to vertical ones, okay? Is it clear? Yeah? Now, an important thing here is that these, this, these inputs are flickering all the time. They're not static inputs. Because of course if you had static inputs, you could say, well, the cells just get tired from picking up whatever they're picking up. But these, these uh, stimuli are changing contrast all the time, moving around all the time. So any point on this picture is statistically equivalent to any other point. And the only thing that changes between this picture and, and that picture is that is the uh, our correlations, our two-point correlations between this point here and that point there. So there's a horizontal correlation here which is stronger than there. Apart from that, the two are statistically similar. Okay. Now you don't have to do it with lines, you can uh, use other patterns. So here, for example, they've used, uh, they wanted to compare a stimulus where there's a correlation everywhere, so it's uniform but flickering in, in, in intensity and time with a uh, stimulus that has correlation on, uh, that are much more local and anti-correlation between checkerboards. And so you can measure the sensitivity of the cell to these two inputs after adapting to the checkerboard, and you measure it again after adapting to coarse grained, to, to the coarse grained stimulus, yeah. And what you see is that after you've adapted to the coarse grained stimulus, the sensitivity to the checkerboard rises from the previous case, whereas the sensitivity to the white field, to the coarse grain stimulus, decreases, okay? 
So you don't have a uniform adaptation to any pattern, but you have a pattern-specific adaptation. Okay? And this, as I said in my cartoon, occurs over a few seconds. So over after a few seconds, maybe 10, maybe 20, you're back to base state. Okay. So how does this work? Uh, I'd like to try to explain how this works in some detail. And to do that, I, we should go back to the, to the anatomy. So recall the anatomy with this direct pathway of excitation, some lateral pathway with inhibition. And one thing I, I hid from you before was that these amacrine cells not only feed into ganglion cells, but they can also inhibit directly the bipolar cell terminals here. Okay, so that's an element that we'll use. So there's two ways that this pattern-specific adaptation can happen, and I'm going to illustrate for you uh, both of them sequentially. The first, the first way that I've called a learning, learning model relies on uh, the following property of synapses. The property says that if two neurons are active at the same time, then the synapse between the two will strengthen. Okay. So what happens, for example, if I illumine, uh, if I shine a bar, a vertical bar of light, on this simple model retina, on this little network, okay? So if I do that, then this cell will be active at the same time as the ganglion cell, and as a result, um, these synapses will get stronger, okay? Now remember, this is an amacrine cell, so it's inhibitory, so since these synapses are getting stronger, this ganglion cell is more inhibited and so less active. Okay, so in time, its activity decreases. But now, if I take out this bar of light, and I now suddenly shine a horizontal bar of light, then what happens? These uh, amacrine cells that have been strengthened are not invoked anymore, but these are, but these have weak synapses, and so the activity rises again, exactly like in the cartoon that I showed you before. So that's exactly as if the, the ganglion cell had acquired a, a receptive field that were kind of elongated horizontally. Okay? Now, a nice thing about this model is, is that it relies on this very generic mechanism that is known to happen in synapses. And uh, people believe that it's one of the ways you memorize things, that uh, some, at least part of memory, relies, a part of storing information in the brain relies on changing the strength of synapses between neurons that are coactive. Okay? But now one problem with this model is that typically this happens on longer time scales, at least in the examples we know. Maybe it could happen fast in the retina, but in the other examples we know it happens slower. So there's another model that solves this problem. I call this model the depression model. And depression is just the following very widespread property of synapses that say that if a cell is activated for a long time, by long I mean one second, two seconds, five seconds, something like this, then its synapse will automatically become weaker. A synapse cannot, sustained, cannot sustain a strong activity for a long time. Okay? So <clears throat> let's, let's assume that the bipolar cells here have this property, that these synapses have this property. So what, again, let me go through the cartoon again. So what happens if I illumine this little network with a ver vertical bar? then what happens is that this amacrine cell now is silencing the terminal of this bipolar cell. So it's as if this bipolar cell didn't exist. It's, it's shut up by the amacrine cell. On the other hand, these two bipolar cells are not silenced by the amacrine cells because they're not excited, and so these are active. But since they're, if they're active for quite some time, for a second, let's say, they'll depress, and so their synapses will become less useful. So these two synapses kind of become less useful in uh, some amount of time. And as a result, the overall activity of the ganglion cell decreases, okay? Now let's switch the en environment and um, shine a horizontal bar of light, okay? Then now those synapses that have weakened are not invoked anymore because they're silenced anyways by these two amacrine cells. On the other hand, these synapses are invoked and they're not silenced anymore by these amacrine cells and so the activity rises again. And so again, it's as if the receptive field, uh, of, it's as, as if the receptive field of this ganglion cell had become elongated. Okay. 
So a nice thing about this model is that it uses this depression mechanism that is absolutely widespread in, in nervous cells, in, in neurons. And, um, but the twist here is that uh, something that you may have noticed is that I really needed amacrine cells to be uh, uh, arranged anisotropically. If every bipolar cell got inhibition from everywhere, then this wouldn't work. But this anisotropic arrangement is very plausible. Maybe later I can um, tell you more about it. I don't want to spend too much time on these details, but if you're interested, like, ask me, I'll tell you. Okay, so just for those of you who are physicists or more interested in, in formulae, I want to uh, uh, assure you that w these do not remain at the level of cartoons. And you can actually formalize these things in, in mathematical terms. So I'll just quickly give you uh, this example. You can relate the activity of the ganglion cell to the activity of bipolar cells. And as I said, uh, so here, this is the, the learning model, okay? So the, this, this, I'm first going through this, and then we'll go through that. So then here you have some direct pathway that is excitatory, which is this B, okay? Which is some prefactor of the activity of, of which, me, which just, just describes how much effect a bipolar cell has on a ganglion cell. And then you have an indirect pathway that is contained in this A, and you see from this minus sign that it's inhibitory, and that describes the combined effect of the bipolar and the amacrine cell. And what we said is that the strength of this synapse, of the amacrine synapse, will increase as a function of the coactivity of the, of, of the bipolar cell and the uh, ganglion cell. Okay? increase as a coactivity of, it, of its own coactivity with the ganglion cell, but is it's itself excited by bipolar cells. So you can rewrite it this way, okay? Now the depression model is a little bit different because there the ganglion cell is receiving input from various bipolar cells through this prefactor, and that is modulated by amacrine cells that directly inhibit the bipolar cells, and that corresponds to this term, okay? And now what is changing here is not the amacrine cell synapse, but it's the bipolar cell synapse. And what we said is that this bipolar cell will depress uh, as a function of its own activity. And its own activity, of course, depends on how much it's modulated by the amacrine cell. Okay. So once you write these equations, of course I'm cheating with you because these are all linear. In reality, there's all kinds of nonlinearities that are important and so on. But it's a, it's a harmless cheat. Uh, so you can solve everything, even with the nonlinearities, you can solve all these equations. And so what you do is, um, by the way, it's always better to write down some model and cheat and then see what you get. That's the, the Jesuit uh, principle, that it's better to ask for forgiveness than for permission. So, the, so the, what you can do here is to put in any input you want, so any activities of the bipolar cells, and then you solve these equations and then you get the output, and when you get the output, you can read off from the output what, uh, what kind of adaptation went on. Okay, so I don't want to bore you too long with formulae, but you can do this. If, if I call this combination the receptive field, B minus A is this little receptive field, you can actually solve for how the receptive field evolves, and I'm not expecting you'll understand everything here. I just want to illustrate that the receptive field, you can express this entirely as, as a function of this little thing here, and this little thing is the correlation, the spatial correlation in the input, okay? So I can express everything at the end in terms of how much correlations I had in the input in given uh, spatial orientations. And so I can tell you how much the cell has adapted in a correlation-specific manner. And I can do this for both the learning model and the depression model, okay? So all that is very cute, and by the way, in the depression model, it depends both on the correlation and also on the, on the structure of the circuit through this term that has to do with how the amacrine cells are arranged, as I had promised. Anyway, all this is very cute, but once you read, uh, once you do this calculation and read all this thing, what is important is to try to come up with some qualitative effect and try to predict, to propose some new experiments. So one experiment that you could propose is the following. And I find it very cute. So I suggest you first show some whole field flicker, then you show vertical bars, and then you switch to horizontal bars. 
So what you'll get in both models is what you expect. You'll get sharp rises at each of the switches and then waning because you're adapting. The, res the, cell, the response of the cell wanes because you're adapting. But a very amusing thing is that in the first model, the second peak will be larger than the first, whereas in the second model, the first peak will be larger than the second. Okay? And why does it amuse me so much? It's because here, you see, you, you, if you do this experiment, what you're measuring is cell activity, which is very easy to measure, and it's something that is very coarse. It's not a very detailed thing. You don't need a powerful microscope or anything. And then you can make a statement on what kind of mechanism is going on in the synapses. So you measure something very coarse, and you can make a statement and say whether it's more probable that it's correlation-based learning or whether it's just simple depression. Okay, and if I hadn't done this model, I'm not sure I would have thought of this just offhand. Okay. So what we saw up to, up to now is that these, um, uh, this little circuit can act as a computational device and actually can represent these receptive fields that can readapt in various shapes. But this was a very general thing. I didn't tell you whether it's a specific kind of cell that does it or the, whether it's a very specific kind of synapse. And in fact, there are much more specialized computational devices that have to do with specific kinds of cells. But to, to, to notice this, we have to go slightly deeper in the retina and notice that every single type of cell, I've t uh, every single class of cell I've t told you about comes in many different types. You have, <coughs> sorry, you have one type of rod and three types of cones in humans. You have a few types of horizontal cells. You have about 10 types of uh, eight or 10 types of bipolar cells. You have many types of amacrine cells, many types of ganglion cells. And they differ by their lateral extent, by the width of their dendritic trees. They also differ by their depth into the retina. So clearly, if a cell is wider, it will receive, if a ganglion cell is wider, it will receive input from many more bipolar cells. And so its angle of sight, its receptive field will be much larger, for example. A similar distinction is obtained with, uh, with depth. These bipolar cells um, project at very precise locations within their layer, so within the, the retinal layer. So that's like a second stratification within the retina. But the main uh, thing to notice here is that this essentially divides in two layers, the off layer and the on layer. And what is meant by off and on is that ganglion cells that receive input from bipolar cells that end in the on layer will respond to light. Whereas ganglion cells that, respond, that uh, connect with bipolar cells in the off layer will respond to dark, not to light. And that's why they're called off. So on and off bipolar cells have actually reversed, uh, inversed uh, receptive field. One is sensitive to dark in the center and light in the surround, and the other one is the other way around. Okay. Now, I've told you all this to show you that when you put these two systems together, something extremely interesting may happen. And by the way, this is a scoop, because you're, I think, the first people to hear about it, or among the first. It, it was just discovered. So again, we're coming back to one of our early problems. How could you distinguish lateral motion, this girl moving, running away from you, for example, to looming or approach motion if she improbably runs towards you? Okay. Now, these stimuli are um, very nice. I much prefer them, but these are simpler. So if you uh, suppose that you have some dark object that is moving laterally, well, both its edges are moving, this one leftwards and this one also leftwards. But if now I have an object that is approaching, its image on the retina is expanding, so the edges move in two different directions, this one leftward and that one rightward. Is it clear what I'm saying? Yeah, let me write it. So both edges here are moving in the same direction, whereas here, when it's approaching, the image uh, enlarges on the retina, and so the edges are moving in different directions. And so um, uh, Thomas Munch, in the lab of uh, Boton Roska in, in, at the FME in Basel, did exactly this experiment and found a cell in the retina that responds to this approach motion to the, the edges expanding, but doesn't respond to the lateral motion. So he takes this cell, he flashes some grating like this, so he sees a response when he flashes. Then he waits, and then he suddenly starts moving these things around, either laterally or in an approach motion, so expanding. So you see a big response for the approach and 
barely any response for the lateral motion. Now, this is happening in the retina, in one cell in the retina. It's not in the brain, you haven't thought about it, it's already in your eye, okay? Now, you can do this experiment much more precisely. Look at the left and right panel uh, first. So here is uh, this bar, and you start expanding it at different velocities, and you see that you always have some response, even at relatively low velocities. But then if you move both edges at the same time, so the bar just slides along, just moves along, you see barely any response, even at very high velocities. And in fact, you can do this experiment for all, you know, for all kinds of velocities of the left and the right edge, and you see that you only see responses in this top left quadrant, which is where at least one of the two edges is uh, moving as if it were approaching, okay? So this cell will actually start firing when the girl is running towards you and will be silent if she runs laterally or runs away from you. Okay. So how does this work? Uh, it must work in a very kind of exotic manner because remember I told you before that these ganglion cells have such receptive fields and we said that if I have a bar, that a bar of light uh, or, in, or dark, uh, if it's an on cell, a bar of light that is moving through its receptive field, what I'll see is a big response. And here I'm just telling you, if I have a bar, I see no response. This seems like a blunt contradiction to what I've, said you, what I've told you just before. Okay? So what we believe is happening is that the receptive field of these cells are completely different. These receptive fields are not made up of one center in the surround, but they're actually a collection of many little subunits that come as pluses and minuses. So what are the, the plus subunits excite the cell, the minus subunits inhibit the cell, okay? The plus subunits are themselves excited by dark, and the minus subunits are excited by light, okay? So if I shine light on, on these minus subunits, it'll inhibit the cell. If I shine dark on the plus subunits, it, it'll excite the cell, okay? <coughs> So how, what happens if I have something that is looming, that is approaching, where if I go from one uh, time step to the next time step, what I, the difference between the two is that here I have added this annulus of dark, okay? So this annulus of dark will excite these pluses and I'll see a response, okay? On the other hand, if I, an, I have an object that is moving what I see is that if it's moving, say, towards the left, then the left edge, if I compare one time step, whoops, sorry. If I compare one time step to the next, the left edge has covered some area, so I have some added dark on the left, but the right edge has moved to the right and so has uncovered some light area, and so I have some light on the, on the right, okay? And so the dark excites these plus cells, the, the the, the light excites the minus cells, the two cancel, and the ganglion cell doesn't respond at all, okay? Uh, by the way, not only it's a scoop, but this is the first cell in a mammalian that uh, has been seen doing this. Uh, and, and it's in mouse. Uh, they, there have been similar cells in pigeon and in insects, but they've all been seen in, in the brain, not in the retina. So that's the first one in the brain, and sorry, in the retina and in mammalian. So <clears throat> let me just quickly show you that again, this is something that you can model and try thinking about it quantitatively. So you have the receptive field of the organglion cell now that is made up of all these small subunits, and you have some input uh, on it, this bar. And uh, you, what you have to do is to see how the edges of this input will excite the subunits, sum the effect of all these subunits on the ganglion cell, and from this sum, predict what is the response. So every one of these subunits, very similarly to what we said before, processes things uh, with, some of these temp with one of these temporal filters that you can deduce directly from data. Then you sum all of the convolutions of these filters with the input, you get what enters the ganglion cell, and then you have a simple nonlinearity that transforms that quantity into the firing rate of the ganglion cell. Okay, so it's a very similar model to what we've talked about before. And what you see here is that this model, uh, the predictions of this model are drawn here in these black uh, dots, in this black dotted line. And you see that here it reproduces these responses pretty well, and here, again, there's no response whatsoever. <coughs> 
So what have we learned by uh, cooking up such a model? Not a huge amount. We, we've not learned a huge amount uh, because it's mostly post-diction. We knew what we wanted to get and we got something uh, uh, not very far. However, we learned one thing, which is that these ingredients are enough for, um, for looming, uh, looming sensitivity. Okay? Now, it's possible that there are even more complicated mechanisms in play, that there are single cells that do very complicated things and so on, but it's not necessary because this works. Okay? And the other thing that is nice is that we've set the parameters in the model from uh, what we know about the circuitry of the retina and so on, and we saw not only did it re reproduce well uh, the, the, the experiments for one velocity, but also for all the other velocities. So that gives us some confidence that the model may not be too poor. <coughs> so uh, let me just uh, remark um, about, to, to close this business of looming uh, sensation, let me just remark one thing. In all these examples you saw, whoops, in all these examples you saw, we had the, Im the input was inside the receptive field of the ganglion cell, so it had to be small enough. Now if the, if the ganglion cell has a very, very small receptive field, then only very small objects will be in, in it, and we'll only see very small objects approaching, and so it's not very useful. So how large are these ganglion cells? Well, from what we can say, these cells are about at least 10 degrees. So every one of these cells sees at least 10 degrees of your visual field. So they're very, very large cells with very poor resolution, okay? So what does 10 degree mean? It means about, if you're a mouse, it means about a uh, needle at about one to five meters, okay? So now it was nice to have looming detection for uh, the girl running towards you, but if you're a mouse, it becomes much more critical to see uh, an eagle that runs towards you, and presumably when it's about five meters away from you and uh, the cell start, starts firing, it probably means that you have to do something about it. So I wanted to show you some other uh, these such devices. One device in the retina that is able, one cell that is able to distinguish global motion from uh, the motion of an object against the background, and also another device that is able to distinguish left-moving objects from right-moving objects. So, but I think I don't have so much more. I have maybe about 15, 20 minutes, something like this. So maybe I'll skip this, and if there's time at the end, I can tell you a word about it. Or if anybody's interested, you can ask me in the questions and answer. But now, just for fun, maybe I'll skip this more serious stuff and just go in the more speculative um, uh, less serious or uh, yeah, more speculative part of the, of the lecture. So up to now, what we've s seen is that um, there are these uh, little circuits in the retina that can be thought of as little computational devices that can carry out quite complicated processing, uh, the result of which is sent to the brain. And this processing depended on the architecture, so on, the, on, the, on the, sh uh, the properties of the circuitry inside this device, and also on the properties of synapses that connect the cells within that device. Okay. But of course, this device is made up of single cells. And uh, these devices, there are many such devices in the retina, and they, so they form a whole population. And so it's very natural to ask, well, how much computation already exists in single cells, maybe some amount, and how much computation can I do when I have all these devices clumped together that send information to the brain? So let me just comment briefly on each of these two things, and then I'll go to, uh, and, and then I'll conclude. So uh, in terms of single cells, I just want to quickly mention one example on photoreceptors. So re remember, photoreceptors are cones and rods, they're the very first cells of your visual system, okay? So if you don't have photoreceptors, you're blind, and uh, they are the cells that pick up light. Some ganglion cells also do, but it's probably not involved in vision, it's probably involved in uh, other rhythms and uh, so on. And, uh, okay, so, so these are the cells that are the very front of your visual system. So I was a bit sneaky, and I gave you the impression up to now that most of the stuff happens in ganglion cells. And in particular, I told you that light adaptation happens in ganglion cells, and that's true. <coughs> but already a huge amount of light adaptation occurs in photoreceptors. 
And actually, maybe most of it happens in photoreceptors. So here you have this illustrated for a macaque photoreceptor and for a salamander. So maybe look at this. It's kind of nicer than that one. So these are responses of the photoreceptors to a small flash of light, a small flash of light. But this flash is superimposed on top of different light backgrounds. Okay? So if you, have a, if you do it in a dark room, you'll see a huge response to this flash of light. And if you do it in a very lit room, you'll see a very, very small response to the same flash of light. Okay? So depending on how much light the photoreceptor has been exposed to, its response will be very different. So suppose you spend you know, an hour in a room with some, some amount of light, that will put your photoreceptor in some state, and that state will be such that the response to such a flash will be, say, that large. If you are in a darker room, it would be larger. Okay? So that has been known for many, many years. Um, but what is new, and, uh, and it's very new, it's maybe a few weeks or a few months old, is this kind of retouched picture. So here you would think that if you had many flashes in succession, as I'm showing here, whoops, sorry, many flashes in succession as I'm showing here, well, what you have to do, roughly speaking, is to look at the response to each one of them and sum them up, and that will give you the response of the cell to the sequence of flashes. So that's the kind of response you see here. And it kind of looks all right that if you sum things up, maybe you'll get something like this. Okay? But if you do it in detail, you see that uh, although it's roughly right, it's not completely right. So here is, in blue is the actual response of the cell to such an input of light. And in red, you have this naive prediction that I've just talked about. What you see is that there are many regions here where there's a big difference between the prediction and the actual output of the cell. And if you look at how much light the cell got about one second or half a second before the time of the discrepancy, you'll see that these are typically rather extreme cases where the, the cell has been either depri de deprived of light or had got, had got too much light in the past one second or half a second. Okay? So you can, you can actually do that much more precisely <coughs> you can look at all the times where the cell got very little light in the last 0.5 seconds, or a lot of light in blue in the uh, past 0.5 seconds, or an average amount of light in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in green. And you can measure the response to flash for each of these cases. And what you'll see is that the largest response is when the, the cell just got less light in the last one second. Okay, so schematically, what is going on here, if I call R the response of the cell and S the stimulus, is that the response of the cell has a fast component that is a function of the stimulus that it just got in the immediate past, okay? But that response is modulated by some function of the stimulus, not in the recent past, but over the last half second or one second, okay? So it's not that it adapts extremely slowly and you have to wait for an hour in a dark room or something like this. It really adapts relatively fast over a scale of one second, half a second, a fourth of a second, maybe two seconds, something like this. Okay. So what it means is that the response of the cell will be sensitive to the statistics, not only, the stati the, not only sensitive to the mean over an hour or a day, but will be sensitive to the statistics of the input over intermediate time scales, like one second. And one second is a very, um, how shall I say, is a very um, reasonable, a very real time scale because uh, humans saccade their eyes, so move their eyes about maybe three or four times a second, okay? And many things change over a range of seconds and things like this, so that's a very, a sensible amount of time over which to look at statistics. And I'm not going to discuss this any longer, but you can see that it opens up all kinds of questions. For example, if you moved your eyes faster, would you adapt m more or less? Um, <coughs> you know, how does the statistics of the input relate to the, uh, to the, um, to the response? How fast can the statistics change uh, uh, in a way that you can still pick it up in the response and, and things like this? So you could pose all kinds of interesting problems. So now let's, uh, let me comment on the other extreme, 
before concluding. So the other extreme was you don't have one cell, you don't have one device, but you have many of these devices, many of these little circuits that end up in a ganglion cell, and each of these ganglion cells sends information to the brain. Now any one brain cell sees many inputs at the same time, okay? So that opens up a whole universe of questions as to how a collection of these cells, a collection of these devices will represent information, and not only one of these cells. So that's really the topic of a whole different lecture, and maybe it would have been wiser for me not even to mention it, but I thought it, it may be still worth just mentioning a few conceptual points uh, to kind of uh, uh, motivate you to, to think about it or look into it. So the first question that uh, arises, which we haven't talked about, at all, talked about at all, is the question of variability. If I go from, say, if these different lines represented different cells, they all more or less do the same things, but the same thing, but here you see this cell has missed a spike, this one has a spike there, this one doesn't, and so on. So there's a little bit of variability. And there's always some amount of variability in the way these cells function. But I don't see a very variable uh, uh, world. You know, every time I turn around, you're there. It's not like one time you're not there and then just after you're there. So, um, so this somehow has to be resolved by the brain. And of course, if I have many, many of, many devices, many such things that, many such cells that do similar things and respond similarly, I can calculate an average and that average, or this brain cell rather, can calculate an average, and that average will get rid of the variability. Of course, I don't want to push that to the limit, because if I have every cell doing the same thing, I will be able to code only for one thing, or a very limited class of things. So I still want my, my devices, my cells, to be heterogeneous, so I can, I can uh, code for different things and pick up different aspects of the stimuli. So there's a trade-off between uh, controlling the variability and coding, uh, and having a large enough coding space, and having a heterogeneous enough system, okay? And the last point, which is maybe the, the most interesting, <coughs> excuse me, is that of correlations. Up to now, we've just talked about one device doing a very specific thing, and if I have many devices that are now sending information, I can either think that they're working kind of independently, a little bit like the orchestra when they tune before they start playing a piece, they're all kind of independent. Or they could be acting in a very correlated manner, watching each other and seeing what the other does and modifying their behavior as a result, a little bit like in the orchestra when they're playing an actual piece. Okay. And so the question of how these correlations may affect or may improve the way you code an input is an open question, which is, I find very interesting. So let me conclude with two panels, uh, one uh, that concerns the contents uh, of the lecture, and the other one that concerns the methods. So what we first saw is that there, the perception or sensation, or visual sensation at least, is extremely active or adaptive, that it's sensitive and it's remodulating itself all the time as a function of the statistics of the input. First we said as a function of the amount of light, then we said as a function of correlations present in the, in the, in the, in the input. And one could ask, how fine can it go? How detailed can my adaptation be as a function of the input that is arriving? Okay. The other thing that always uh, kind of mystifies me a little bit is that this adaptation not only occurs very early on, okay? We just said that light adaptation occurs in the photoreceptor. So as soon as the visual world enters you, it's modified. You don't even have time to see the world as it is because the very first cell changes the world for you, okay? So it happens very early, but then it happens again and again and again, and how, how, how do you decide how you organize it? How much do you adapt early, and how much do you leave to adapt later, and so on? And I don't even know how's the right way to pose this question, but I think there is a question to, to be posed. <clears throat> then what we saw is that part of this active or adaptive perception is carried out by computational devices that are made up of small circuits in the retina, and I showed you some examples of devices, and uh, one could ask, well, how many kinds are there? You know, how specialized can they be? How fine is the stimulus aspect that I can pick up? How sophisticated are they? And we only know a few examples of these devices, I guess, until now. 
Um, also, what we said is that computation doesn't occur in one location, like at the level of circuits or at the level of synapses, but it, it occurs really at many, over many stages. It occurs in single cells, like photoreceptors. It occurs in circuits as a whole, and presumably also uh, complicated computation happens happen, uh, at the level of populations, even in the retina. And the last question, which is some kind of uh, meta question, is um, I guess you, in, you, you kindly invited me here because uh, I, I say I work on theoretical neuroscience, and I hope you haven't been too disappointed that I've told you about the retina. And one could ask, well, is the retina uh, really useful to try to understand something about the brain? So are simple systems like the retina or, say, small worms, about which you know in detail how the brain is wired up, useful to understand the brain or s more complicated things like the cortex or not? And I don't know the answer to that question. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, I think the retina would be interesting even if it didn't uh, give you any hope to understand the brain. Um, and it's very possible that the, the way computation is carried out in the, in, the, um, in the brain, in the cortex, is very different, that things are much more random, things are much, much more plastic, the circuits are much less predetermined, and so on. But I would be very surprised if some elements that you can find in the retina are not present in the cortex just because the machinery is so similar. And also, you have to start somewhere, and I think uh, it's a nice bet to start where you can control things experimentally very precisely. Um, then let me just maybe say two words about uh, why do math, uh, why include math in the way you think about the brain? Um, well. There are a number of reasons, I think. None of them may be super important. But one thing is that math is a nice tool, or mathematical descriptions are a nice tool to relate phenomena, mechanisms, and machinery, and devices that carry out the mechanisms. It's a nice, clean way to, to relate these things. The other nice aspect I find of a mathematical description is that it's a, it's a nice way to uncover analogies. Uh, analogies between cell types, between phenomena, between mechanisms. Uh, and often when we look at, say, a given mechanism or given biophysical problems, we're so, we're so preoccupied by the details that it's very hard to see that it's very analogous to, say, something that happens in other sensory modality. But once you've stripped it down and uh, once you wrote a coarse mathematical model, then it's much easier to see that it looks very similar to something else that is interesting in some other context. Then the, um, maybe the most important uh, input of math or mathematical thinking in, in neuroscience is to propose new experiments. Just because you have the hope of writing a model that uh, allows you to make some new predictions, hopefully qualitative predictions, with which you can pr propose new experiments. And that's probably the most important uh, input of math. And finally, I think math is nice because it makes the idiot smart. And what I mean by this is that probably none of the things I told you today really needed math, okay? If somebody were smart enough, he could have just thought about these cells and come up with the conclusions. And, but math allows you to uh, start from somewhere and to uh, start writing things and kind of is like a, um, uh, a walker that you can use to walk. So it allows you, so it, a good analogy maybe is, you know, um, Newton, um, wrote the Principia in ge with only geometrical arguments and uh, no calculus. And it's extremely clever and extremely complicated and just fascinating to see his, um, his arguments. And of course, on the side, he invented calculus so that now any random school kid can understand what is in the Principia by using the calculus. Um, so it allows you to be a bit smarter, maybe, than, than you would be otherwise. Thank you. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, the most, the most important slide. So this is the slide that gives me most pleasure. And uh, I should thank all the people. These are all the people from uh, which I learned most of what I know on the retina. And they're wonderful people. So, so thank you very much. Il y a de la place pour les questions, bien évidemment. Vous pouvez poser des questions en français, il n'y a pas de problème. Donc, euh, n'hésitez pas. La question, vous avez tout compris <rire>
Euh, je, je vais peut-être avoir juste une question. Enfin, je suis assez impressionné par l'exemple le, de, de l'aigle qui s'approche, donc en fait, il y a des cellules qui, qui sont développées en fait, mm -hmm. par rapport à cette, euh, à cette action. Euh, il y a d'autres actions. Enfin, je veux dire, est-ce qu'on peut, est qu peut utiliser, on va dire, est-ce que la rétine s'est développée justement en se basant sur ses expériences dans la vie ou donc ça c'est une question. Deuxième question c'est en fait en, en sachant ou en essayant d'analyser euh, ces actions qui sont euh, enfin, essentielles pour la vie, est-ce qu'on peut les utiliser justement pour, pour identifier les modèles euh, pour décrire en fait le fonctionnement euh, de la rétine Ok, so. Okay, so this is a big questions, but okay. So first of all, the uh, there is, uh, I guess, undoubtedly, some uh, a lot of evolutionary pressures on how uh, on on how s these circuits are like. Okay, so for example, something that has nothing to do with the retina and about which I know very little, but um, there are circuits that have to do very directly with fear. Okay. And you, when you see a snake, for example, you have a fear reaction before even you can really analyze what you've seen and be really conscious that you've seen a, a snake and so on. And this is because there's a pathway that doesn't go to cortex or maybe goes and comes back very fast and goes mostly through amygdala and is a much faster pathway. And presumably that is some evolutionary, uh, re some result of evolution to enable you to react very fast to um, fearful inputs. Okay. So on the one hand, there are these evolutionary things. On the other hand, there are physical limits that, uh, of you know, how much energy you're, uh, you're willing to spend, uh, how much heat you're willing to generate, how much space you have in your uh, ocular globe, in your brain, um, <coughs> and also limits of the sort. For example, how much uh, resolution can you have given the wavelength uh, of visible light and so on. So you have a combination of pressures that come from just uh, machinery and also from evolution, and these kind of mingle uh, to give you the, the, um, uh, the circus you have, and presumably things are still evolving, and these are still kind of perfecting themselves. Um, now, one question that I always have for myself is how do you weigh these pressures? And you have many, many such pressures, and I don't know how you weigh them, And uh, so I don't know, um, and, and I feel that the, the outcome depends a lot on how you weigh things. So it's very nice when you can find a circuit that uh, does some task, and you can say this task is behaviorally very useful. And what is behaviorally very useful is also a guide to finding these tasks. But I don't know of any method that really kind of Uh, in, a, in a deductive manner, lets you go from one to the other. Uh, okay, so these, um, these, I don't know in detail the answer to that question, and I don't know if anybody knows actually, but these cells are those cells that have been seen in mice are off alpha cells. And so they're very large cells, and they, I, I, if I'm not wrong, they tile the retina in a relatively non-overlapping manner. And so they're much, much sparser than the smaller cells that have more standard receptive fields. And by what factor, I don't know. I could probably calculate it if I had a minute. Um, but I don't want to give an answer which is imprecise now. Uh, but they're much sparser than the... Now, uh, I should say also, in when I, these, these looming uh, sensors that I showed in, in these mammalian cells are very primitive. The ones that have been uh, seen in a pigeon and in, in insect, in locust, are actually much more um, sophisticated. And if you want, uh, for example, they give you some peak of firing before the object has actually reached you, and they look like they do many more computations. And those cells are in the brain, not in the retina, and they're even wider receptive fields. They're much wider, so they may be built upon 
such cells that have kind of an intermediary receptive field between the very uh, s uh, small ones, the high resolution ones, and the very global ones. Now the ratio of uh, sparseness, I, I would have to think about it for a second, but we can calculate it probably. Bon. Vous avez parlé euh, de, du fait que quand on avait des barres qui étaient horizontales ou verticales, on, euh, on avait une espèce d'anisotropie qui se créait, on était plus ou moins sensible à un mm -hmm. sens ou l'autre. Et vous, Surtout l'exposé, vous parlez de temps qui sont euh, de l'ordre de la seconde, du dixième de seconde. Mm -hmm. et, et pourtant, c'est bizarre. On ne voit jamais un objet euh, droit, qui, vertical, qui se tord un peu quand on change euh, assez rapidement les images. Alors, bon... Okay. So my point was not that you would see an object that is straight getting crooked. Okay. Okay. So the way you should imagine it, you have these collection of cells. They're all picking up uh, the amount of light that is coming in. You have cells, as uh, this gentleman said, that have small receptive fields, others that have larger ones. Then the brain kind of recombines all of that together to tell you what image you've seen. Okay. Now each one of these cells has some amount of sensitivity. Okay. And this amount of sensitivity depends on what is the structure of its receptive field. So what I said is that a given cell that has a circular receptive field, maybe in 10 seconds will acquire an elongated receptive field. But you will not see an object being crooked. If you, have, if you had, say, a round object on that receptive field, now that it's elongated, maybe you'll see a slightly lower answer, a slightly lower response in magnitude. Okay. But there's no reason you should see the object itself being crooked. It's just a, a rescaling of the magnitude of the response that you'll get. Okay. I, is it clear? No? So, l l okay, let me draw it here maybe. Ah, it doesn't work. I can, I can, you know. Okay, so if I have here some receptive field center, okay, and then I have a receptive field surround like this, and I want to compare this with a receptive field center that looks like this, and a receptive field, s uh, yeah, a receptive field surround that looks like this, okay. Now suppose I'm shining a bar of light here, okay. Then I'll use this amount of, of inhibition, this amount of inhibition, and this amount of excitation. So, and, and I'll have to sum these, and I'll get out some response. Okay. And here I have quite a bit of, of inhibition, so the response may be actually relatively, relatively small, relatively moderate. Now if instead I shone a bar here, what you can see is that here I'll get a lot of excitation. And so I'll get a very strong response, okay? Because this kind of receptive field is custom made, if you want, is well adapted to respond to a, to a bar of light which is, which is horizontal. But now if I shine a bar of light which is vertical, again, I'll, I'll get much more inhibition than excitation, and again, I'll have a very low response, okay? So it's not actually changing the shape, it's not modifying the shape of what you're seeing but it's just changing the magnitude with which you see something. 